everyone and welcome to this presentation on the threats to the internal validity of a design. This presentation goes hand in hand with the uh, videos on pre-experimental, experimental, and quasi-experimental designs because the threats I'm about to go over are about um, the validity of the design that the researcher used to evaluate the program or intervention. So in essence, the researcher wants to say that it was the intervention that led to the results and nothing else. So these threats are threats against the researcher's ability to make such a claim. And there's two general types of threats. There's uh, what are called single group threats and multiple group threats. And as the, the naming kind of suggests, there are threats that happen when there's only one group of participants in the study, and then uh, another set that um, are, are essentially the same, but happen differently for the, the two groups, uh, well, two or more groups hence the word multiple. <laughs> okay, so let's go over the single group threats first. So um, what would this look like? Um, if you remember, we had the one-shot case study, and then we had the one group pretest post test design. Well, these threats are any other alternative explanation for the results at the post-test. Again, remember, internal validity, the researcher wants to say it was the X, the experiment that, I mean, the experimental group that uh, led to the, to the results. And now we're going to go over some alternative explanations or threats to the researcher's ability to say that. Okay, so the first is the history th threat. This refers to any other event that occurs during the study period that could affect the results. So for example, um, I'm going to use the, the reading comprehension uh, program. So we're trying to increase preschoolers' reading ability and the number of new words that they learn. And so we have a class and we're giving them this special program. Unbeknownst to us, Sesame Street, which everyone in the class happens to love at this time period, um, is doing a special focus during two weeks on uh, just reading and learning new sight words and, and what have you. So at the end, in, in this single group case, was it the reading comprehension program that increased the student's understanding of new words, or was it Sesame Street? So that would be a history threat. Um, there could be other actual historical events that happen, like, um, you know, for example, 9-11 or um, school shootings or what have you that can disrupt any type of study that's happening at that same time if people are affected or nearby or what have you. Um, okay, so then we have what's called the maturation threat. This is any normal growth uh, or maturation that can take place during the course of a study. This can refer to actual physical, biological changes, uh, like especially in children. Um, so with that classroom example that I was giving earlier in terms of studying reading comprehension, if that study is taking uh, place over, let's say, a six-month period, the researcher has to understand and be cognizant of the fact that children's brains are growing rapidly um, during, during um, early childhood. So um, this becomes a threat because if the children's reading comprehension increases in this one group of, of students, then how do we know that it was actually the intervention that led to the results and not just normal cognitive changes and growth that can take place? Um, your book uses another example that I like, which is if we're studying bereavement, we have to be careful in terms of the time frame uh, with the intervention as well, because over time, uh, the, the grieving process leads to healing in, in many cases. So again, was it the intervention or was it just normal healing that happens with time? The testing threat is the effect of having a pretest 
um, when when there's a post-test. So if you recall, we call that the multiple testing effect, and that's a threat. Uh, we're calling it now officially a threat <laughs> um, to the researcher's ability to say that uh, the results on that post-test were because of the intervention and not just an effect of having taken the pretest previously. The instrumentation threat happens when we try to address the multiple uh, testing threat uh, by <laughs> uh, changing the instrument, the pretest. So having a different pretest than the post-test. But sometimes when you do that, uh, it can also lead to um, to different results. So the instrumentation threat is any change in the test itself or the facility of the uh, of measuring on the part of the researcher. So over the course of a certain time period, researchers themselves might become more familiar with the instrument and um, you know, do it more quickly or ask questions in, in, a, in a certain way. Um, but in any case, anything having to do with the instrument itself can also be a threat to the internal validity of the design. Attrition threat, uh, sometimes referred to as mortality, is uh, any kind of non-random dropout through the course of a study. So, for example, if we have a, you know, a group of people and they're all in our study, men and women, and then all of a sudden many of the men drop out, then we have to ask ourselves, what's going on here and that's a pattern that's not random you know half the males dropped out or in this case two-thirds <laughs> of the males dropped out of the study um, that can affect the uh, the results and the internal validity of the design uh, there's also something called statistical regression to the mean which sounds fancier than what it actually is but it's basically the tendency for scores on any given pretest to be closer to the average, especially for those who are at extreme ends of the continuum of scores at the pretest. It's just a, a uh, regression, meaning um, leaning towards the the average of the of the overall group. So a great example I found online uh, sources at the end, of course. Uh, is looking at batting average and how over time that can regress to the mean. So we here we have the batting averages for four people and here's the average for those four and here's 2005 and here's 2006. So especially for uh, the batters <laughs> who were at the extreme end the extreme uh, ends of this continuum of batting averages uh, in 2006 later on a year later their batting average becomes closer to the mean so it's a statistical phenomenon that happens but it's also a psychological phenomenon or in this case a threat to the internal validity of the design so were the if this was a pretest right reading comprehension or what have you and this was the post-test, then um, when we're seeing that there's a change in these uh, batting average or in these averages, then how can we say that it was the intervention that led to those changes versus uh, the statistical regression to the mean? And here's a funny cartoon I found <laughs> um, where the, the son is saying, don't think of it as my grades slipping, think of it as my regression to the mean. <laughs> Uh, a little uh, research humor, very little. <laughs> okay, so one way that I think would be helpful to kind of categorize these threats to remember them is to think of how they're, what they're related to. So we can have participant associated threats like maturation and attrition. We can have measurement associated threats like testing, instrumentation, and regression to the mean. And then one outside source, which is history. 
Okay, so let's move on to multiple group threats. So these are threats that um, happen when there's two or more groups in the study versus all the threats I just went over, which were in the single group case, for example, the one-shot case study or the pretest, post-test design um, that, that I put up earlier. So for example, if we have the pretest, post-test control group design, then well, the question we're asking with the, these threats is, are there any alternative explanations for these results? Another question we're asking is, are the two groups comparable? And this really is about selection bias. Um, remember when we were talking about quasi-experimental designs and uh, them having natural groups or non-equivalent groups because the researcher couldn't control who was in the groups, whether the control group or the experimental group. Uh, so a lot of these threats I'm about to go over can be taken um, care of by the awesomeness of random design, uh, random assignment. So random assignment does kind of take care of a lot of these threats. Um, so most of these are really about quasi-experimental designs, but we still have to kind of think of some of the threats in terms of how they can affect uh, the results. So because it's a question of selection bias, these are all kind of referred to as selection threats. And really what we're wanting to know is, is there any other factor other than the program that can lead to the post-test differences between groups? So this actually going back here uh, has to do with the differences between the two groups at the post-test. Now in the single group case, when we just have that one row, that one group, we're wanting to know if there's anything that affects this outcome other than the, uh, the intervention. Here we want to know, is there anything that affects the difference between these two groups? So it's not just this one outcome, but these two outcomes. Is there any alternative explanation for these designs? So that has to do with uh, what are called selection threats. So it's any other factor other than the program that leads to post-test differences between the groups. And so when I put these um, threads up, you'll see they're all uh, the same ones that I just went over, except now we call them selection threats. So selection history, selection maturation, selection testing, selection instrumentation, selection attrition. Okay, these are all the same threats, except now we're looking at whether or not they affect one group versus the other. We're wanting to know if the, these threats, um, like if history, for example, affected one group's results versus the others, okay? So anytime you see selection, know that that means that there is at least two groups and we're looking at how it affects the differences, the different outcomes between those two groups. Okay, so now we're moving on to social or what are called interaction threats. And these have to do with social pressures when you have groups of people. And a lot of these threats can be minimized by isolating the two groups from each other. But in some cases, that's just not possible. If you have you know, two classrooms, for example, how do you keep them separate from each other? How do you keep, keep the kids from talking to each other on the playground? Um, but if it is possible to separate the two groups, then the social aspect of the interaction between the groups can be um, stopped. Okay, so the first one is diffusion or imitation of treatment. And this is where those in the control group or the comparison group learn about the treatment from those in the treatment group. So. Um, it's people talking to each other basically. So if it's two classrooms, then the kids in the reading comprehension group go up to their friends in the other classroom and say, hey, we're getting this new cool, you know, video interactive, you know, Chromebook uh, uh, study program and we're learning so much and this is what we're learning. This is what they're telling us. And then those in the who were in the comparison classroom um, are kind of 
getting some version of the treatment. So that can affect the results. Then there's compensatory rivalry, and this is where the control group competes to keep up with the, the treatment group. So if the uh, experimental group is getting something special and those in the who, and people know that they're in the control group they may try extra hard just to keep up with those in the in the experimental group if it's reading comprehension and the child in the control group uh, is talking to the one in the treatment group and let's say the the child in the treatment group isn't telling them what they're doing specifically but says hey we're learning all this cool stuff about reading comprehension then those in the control group might say hey we don't want to look like we don't know anything about reading so let's all you know form a study group and and learn how to read better <laughs> um, but okay you get the point um, okay and then there's compensatory equalization of treatment which is a long way of saying that others involved in the study can give a compensating type of treatment to the control group to make up for the fact that they aren't receiving the super duper special uh, treatment. So let's say this is that reading comprehension um, experiment and uh, or quasi experiment in this case and we have this new interactive computer based reading comprehension program and this teacher is super excited about uh, implementing it uh, but then the class with the teacher that isn't getting it um, starts to feel bad and then the teacher feels bad for her, her students so she says hey why don't we really focus on reading comprehension as well so it's not the same exact treatment it's it's compensatory uh, but um, because they feel bad or for whatever other reasons they decide to um, basically uh, affect the study <laughs> in a negative way uh, and then lastly, we have what's called resentful demoralization, where the control group, those in the control or the comparison group, sort of get give up or get discouraged. Maybe they know they're in the placebo group um, and they just kind of give up. So they perform poorly and it has nothing to do with the fact that they're in the control group, but they just were like, you know, forget you if I'm not getting the super duper reading comprehension scale, uh, I'm sorry, reading comprehension uh, intervention, then I'm just not going to try at all. So um, here's my picture for that. Um, <laughs> and I believe that's it. Yes, here are the sources of the images. And then um, we're at the end.